We are studying Romans 2, beginning in verse 17, both in class and in the sermon this morning. We're going to approach it as a topical lesson in the sermon, but we need to look at the verses and apply them. I was blessed in that my mom and dad were members of the church. Now, I've been raised in the church. I've even slept in the church. And uh, my grandparents on my dad's side were members of the church. And most of my uncles and aunts on my dad's side were members of the church. What advantage does that give us? If we're familiar with the church, raised in the church, it's part of our heritage. What advantage does it give us? We need to ask and answer that question. Support. Support. It gives us an example. Ken? Example. An example. Foundation. Foundation, root, Gary was saying. Exactly the same because it gave me a basis for how to live my whole life. They were consistent. Uh, we practice what we preach, hopefully. We were there every time the doors were open. As I heard later in life, I'm not sure I knew that then, uh, I laughed to say I even slept in the church. I woke up one Sunday night, and it was dark, and I was asleep on the church pew. And my mom and dad had left. They thought, each of the nine children were in the car. And some were younger then. I was the second of nine, as I told you. They came back, they didn't get all the way home, but they came back very quickly. I woke up, and tell me what I knew. I knew exactly where it was. I knew it was a safe place. And I knew they would come back to get me because they knew where I was. You ever think maybe they will let many kids that might here get trying to get real fun? <laughs> Terry said yes. No. I was the one probably they might have considered, but my older brother also. Uh, I just want us to be thankful if we have roots in the first century church. I didn't, but you know, I, I've seen things. One, I, I think that a lot of people. With history like this in church, a lot of kids come think they, they don't have to do anything. I see people that were converted seem to appreciate the church a lot more than in people that were uh, like like you're talking about. Well, you and, and I, and I, I may be wrong about that, that, that's my opinion of it. Your opinion is correct. We might as well have a prayer to go home. Because that's exactly what these verses are going to teach us, R.L. We think we have an advantage and we take great pride in it. He's talking to the Jews, but he's talking to us as members of the church. That's how it has to be applied for us today. And we think we're okay because we have that rich, long heritage. And we believe in truth. And we believe that we are following the truth. And all of those things are correct and they're good and, and we need to be thankful for that. But none of that makes any difference. None of it makes any difference if we don't practice what we preach. If we don't live what we believe. If we don't follow the truth. We don't follow what we know, which is the truth. And that's exactly what Paul is dealing with. He's talked about the unrighteous who's just put God out of his mind. He wants nothing to do with it. He's talked about the religious sinner, if you will. And he's talked about the one who, though he never had the law, his conscience is his law. And those are three of the lessons leading up to verse 17 this morning. Now you, if you call yourself a Jew, and every time we use that phraseology in class this morning, let's apply it to members of the body of Christ. If you say you're a member of the body of Christ, and if you rely on that, and you brag about your relationship to God, 
If you know his will and approve of what is superior because you're instructed by the law, if you're convinced that you're a guide for blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of the infants, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. And he just made a long list of all the advantages that the Jew has and applying them conversely to us. We have those things. We have a rich heritage. We know the truth. We believe that we're supposed to guide others to that truth. We believe it matters. And he says, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who brag about the law, do not, or do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. I adopted the title for the lesson uh, here in class is they are watching us. People are watching. And we can blaspheme our God among the world if we don't act according to that which we believe. If we don't practice what we preach. They're watching us. Uh, I've been in circumstances where more people come to the building looking for benevolence in other places and in one particular place over 12 years and one gentleman would come in fairly often and they set boundaries of what we could give how we could help and I would meet those boundaries given by the deacon over benevolence through the elders and um, and then he would sit down and we would visit for a while. And he appreciated what we were doing. We weren't meeting all of his needs, but we showed that we cared. And it made a difference. And another person could come in, and they did from time to time, and they had a very high demand. And it could not be reached. Pay my rent, fix my car, it needs about $900 worth of engine repair and such things. And I would, as kindly as I could, we will be glad to give you a week's worth of groceries and you can pick out what you want to eat. I'll take you to the pantry right now, but we cannot help you with what you're asking. And he only came a couple of times, but he gave this response and it made an impression upon me. He said, you're supposed to do this. This is something you're supposed to do. Aren't you a member of this church with a tone, an attitude? Usually I would ask them, where do you attend? Have you gone to them? And if you're not attending somewhere, you're invited to come back here. Because if you were a member of this congregation, my answer to you would be very different. We would do much more if you were a member of this congregation. I encourage you to find a church home. And I hope you'll come back here. Well, you're supposed to. What kind of church are you? And uh, people are watching. But sometimes their attitude is such that whatever I've done, whatever mistakes I've made, you're responsible to undo them. And I am not accountable. I'm not responsible. And there's an entitlement attitude to it. Because you're the church. And of course, I'm representing a congregation of 445, 50 people. And there is a responsibility we have to our community. And they are watching. But there's also a difficult line there as you would speak to what they think you're supposed to be about 
and what you really are. All of these advantages, all of this knowledge, all of this standing before God, all of these things by which we could boast. We could boast about them, and there's a rightful boast, and there's a harmful boast. But that's where we need to go this morning. Listen to Jeremiah 9, verse 23 and 24. Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom, or the strong man boast of his strength, or the rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts boast about this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, who exercises kindness and justice and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. If we're to boast of anything, raised in the church, members of the church, grandparents, parents, aunts, uncles who are part of the church, let's boast of what the Lord did in our life. Let's boast about what he made known to them and be thankful for their courage as they may have left other religious groups when they were young. My mom did. And came to realize that I need to do what this book says that I must do. They followed what they were taught. And in some cases went against those things that maybe they had been taught before. Um, we need to be genuine. And we need to know that God sees us and he knows us and he knows us from the inside out. And that's what matters first and foremost. But people are watching. People are watching. And uh, Satan smiles in hell and say, uh, angels weep in heaven when an elder or minister or member falls. And the more public the fall, the happier Satan is. Because he can point to us and say, huh, that's what they represented themselves to be. Now you see who they really are. They're watching us. And Satan loves it. Oh, I do not delight in telling you, but I know of four ministers in my past some in congregations I was closely aligned with in town uh, through family or friends who were involved in sexual unfaithfulness. And the writers in looking and applying this lesson makes the argument that how often do you hear someone publicly speaking against and you can draw the line and fill in the blank and then within a reasonable amount of time, find out they're doing exactly that. They're involved in those things, even sexual unfaithfulness. And uh, it's, it speaks to us to just be genuine. Just be certain you're genuine. Um, verse 18, if you know his will and approve what is superior, uh, and this, the older translations use the concept of discernment, you understand those things. Um, and he speaks of conviction, verse 19, the instructor, verse 20, uh, maturity, the embodiment of knowledge and truth, maturity implied, you then, who teach those things, how do you live? How do you live? Uh, we are sinning saints. We have the right to teach the truth. We must present it as the goal of each of us. And yet we're sinning saints. And because of that, we need to be, to the best of our ability, the people who will back up those claims of teaching. Uh, we all must speak against sin. 
and yet we're all sinners. And that's why we're humbled when we teach certain verses. Have you ever heard the expression, saved by the grace of God, there go me, there goes me? Saved by the grace of God, I could be where that person is, if. And it involves different decisions, different backgrounds, different people influencing my life. A lot of variables come into that, but saved by the grace of God, we are where we are today. And I'm thankful for that. And I don't take it for granted, I know you don't. But it humbles me to realize how blessed I have been and aware that others haven't been so blessed. Others weren't raised in that environment. And I think R.L.'s comment earlier is true in that if we feel as if being raised in the church and faithful to the church for a number of years, that it's an entitlement and a guarantee of something ahead. It's not an entitlement. I'm not do that. It's by God's grace. And it's certainly not a guarantee. We could all go astray between today and the last day of our life. It involves a constant understanding and application of principles in our life. To not let that pride be turned upside down, if you will. To not have taken advantage of all of those things, even though we've had them, Terry. And being born into a family that believes and that is active in the church does not put you into Christ. No. <laughs> it doesn't do that. That's not, you know, that's not, yeah, that's can't. the Jewish way. Yeah. to a certain extent. They were born and they were a Jew. Yeah, but we'll see that in the verses in a minute, but absolutely. I could not come into the church on the back of my grandfather or my, my dad, my mom. It was a choice I had to make. And staying faithful to the church is a choice I must make day by day. And I think we'd be amazed at how many people feel very comfortable with the religious group they, they are in, even though they come to realize that it did not come into existence for thousands of years after Acts 2, when the church was established on the day of Pentecost. That's the one we want to be a part of, not the one in 17 or 18 or 1900 that came into being, established around an individual with good understandings of many things. Uh, it's a blessing. It's a blessing but not a guarantee. And we need to be faithful to the best of our ability. Uh, let me read you a couple of things uh, suggested as delusions of the self-righteous. Those who are privileged with religious knowledge, exposure to good teaching, familiarity with the truth, are also those most capable of self-deception. These errors often seem reasonable or unimportant, but they turn out to be poison for the soul. We must be on our guard lest we convince ourselves that, one, our years of service overcomes our spiritual downfalls. How long I was a Christian doesn't matter if I cease to be one. And the history does not guarantee the future. God will overlook some sins because we built up some spiritual equity in other areas. I like that phrase. We built up on some good standing before God because of certain things that we've done as Christians as if to nullify other things that we acknowledge we're involved in and are slow to leave and we put it as a checks and balance perhaps in our thinking and we've been given so much that God is obligated to help us in our relationship with spiritual giants hoping that it will rub off on us and make us more acceptable to God. Uh, good companions corrupt Good morals? No. Evil companions. 
good companions are good for us. Uh, I, I relate it occasionally to like being in the bumper cars when you go to the fair. Uh, the bumper cars are filled with good, righteous people just like you. And we bump up against each other from time to time because it's part of the dollar value of the ride. We pay a dollar to do that. But it's not personal. And it's not deadly. And because it's not personal, we can laugh as we bump up against each other's each other and then get off the ride and be okay. Uh, and again, it's a metaphor. We have our issues, and as Charles Hodge says, stick with those you're stuck with. We have our issues, maybe, from time to time, but they're matters of opinion. We don't let them come between us and the fact that we're brothers and sisters. We don't let it affect the church. Um, but there are issues that come up. It's part of ownership, if you will. Uh, turn with me to James 3. I've been amazed over the years that I'm not sure we have always understood what was being said here. James chapter 3 verse 1 makes a definitive statement. We kind of brush it aside or we lessen the value of the words. But James is saying something that we need to hear. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers. And stop right there. Hear that for what it is. Some people ought not to be teachers, is what he's saying. There's a reason, and we see it next, but we, we just go right through that statement. Some of you should not presume to be teachers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. He's saying be careful if you take upon the role of teacher, because there's a higher judgment that will be brought to bear in your life. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he's a perfect man able to keep his whole body in check. Uh, we all make mistakes. We all could go astray. But there are some people because of a tendency, he seems to say, because of a greater tendency, ought not to be teachers. Because you haven't met the standard, what it seems to say in verse 2. You haven't met the standard that a teacher would have. And some ought not to presume to be teachers. So there's prestige and honor, but also accountability. Um, the stumbling aspect uh, I want to be delicate with what I share with you. In a place where we worked in the past, a young man was on fire for the Lord. His son was younger, but he was in a grade to where he wanted to teach that Sunday morning class and have an effect on his son, its ambitious desire. And uh, he petitioned someone, if could I teach that class? And the person says, well, to himself, I see your enthusiasm. I see that you want to be in the class where your son is. And yeah, I, let, let's do it. Teach that class for a month, see how it goes. He taught that Sunday morning class. And someone mentioned to the elders, I was the minister, do you realize that so-and-so taught the grade class Sunday morning? No, we didn't realize that, the elders responded. And I'll talk to the person who gave the okay for him to teach that class. Now, most congregations have in place a uh, protocol that you go through. One, you buy books that you can 
feel good about that aren't from a denominational background to give to everybody, but teachers more mature, able to see through. Uh, perhaps you buy the book and use it for guidance to teach the class. But if you buy that book and it has denominational things in it, the students might not be with you when they read that page and will believe what they read. Whereas the teacher can ignore those things and teach what's okay in the book. So books have to be approved. Secondly, teachers need to be approved. No one should be invited to teach a class here or asked to teach a class who's a member without the shepherds being aware of it. We might know things you don't know, is what they would say. And in that case, that, that um, father had been involved in counseling with the minister and the elders were aware that he had a drinking problem. So he wanted to do better. He wanted to teach his son a class, but the elders would have said, no, this isn't the time. We're dealing with something in his life, and we need to see how this turns out. Some ought not to be teachers. Some ought not to be teachers because of some things in their life that's not the example for, shall we say, fifth and sixth graders. Um, all of that comes to bear when you're dealing with where we are, who we are, whose we are, and how we're doing. The progress that we're making or the difficulties that we're going through. Um, those who are capable of teaching need to be responsible first for themselves and then for what they're teaching. And Paul seems to be saying that here. Uh, what did God have in mind when he chose the children of Israel? I'm not sure we talked about that. We won't have time in the sermon. We'll be going to other things. What was his goal for Israel when he called them as his people? The phrase most commonly used is they were to be a light to the Gentiles. They were to be a light to the Gentiles. In other words, the Gentiles, without the law, not part of the covenant with God, would see those people and envy that relationship. They would be envious of what the Jews had as it talks of their relationship to God. The best example I know uh, of times when it worked is when the children of Israel were traveling through the wilderness. And as they were approaching the city of Jericho, we were told that Rahab the prostitute had come to believe in God, the God of heaven and earth, because she had heard about the victories that Israel had brought to bear against several of the Jebusites, Moabites, the Ites, I call them, some of the Ites of the New Testament, of the Old Testament. <laughs> and she knew that they were not of a military talent or size to have won such a victory. And she gave the credit to God. God brought about that victory. So it brought a belief in God, in her. And as it ultimately led forward, she and her household were saved because of the things they did for the, for the spies who came into the city. That gets back to your point about people watching. No. Okay, she heard. She heard that. She didn't see it. She didn't see it. But she heard about it. Yeah. It was the God that she wanted. Yeah, it was the God she believed in because of the acts of Israel to the God that brought about, let's just call it for our purposes today, a life change. Uh, battles won, but life change that she wanted for herself. Um, I don't know of people who've done this. I just read about the possibility uh, that this would take place. 
the possibility of someone having great confidence in their relationship to God because they've chosen the worst person they could think of who claimed to be a Christian, and they would look at that worst person and think to themselves, I'm better than they are, so I'm okay. I'm better than they are, so I'm okay. Now, who do we compare ourselves to? To Jesus Christ. And we'll never be good enough to be better than him. So it reminds us of our need of him, and it humbles us, and it raises a high level of gratitude in us for what Christ makes possible in our life. We compare ourselves to the standard not the worst person we can find. And um, it's a humbling situation. It's a humbling opportunity for us to see and respond to those things. Um, to look up and to look down. We look up and then we look down. Yeah. It's better to look up than to look down. Yeah. It's better to look up than to look down, absolutely. Um, what does the word blasphemed mean? God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Talked again. Terry? Talked again. Put down. Yeah. Uh, discredited. Defiled. Yeah, defiled. Yeah. yeah, it's a little stronger. Those are those are good beginnings. Look down. Uh, but you defile. You dishonor. Uh, you say things that aren't correct. You, you cause people to say things that aren't correct about God. Remember the warning to the friends of Job when they were told that you need to build an offer of sacrifice and perhaps God will repent uh, or, or forgive as you do that because you have not spoken that which was right about me. And he says that twice. We cause people to say things that aren't right about God if we serve him in a way that disparages who he is, that takes him off the throne, that doesn't give him honor, several ideas that come up. You dishonor God by breaking the law. You bring blasphemous thoughts from the Gentiles because of that comparison. So several things come to bear. Let's change slightly direction, but the similar thought, verse 25. Let me mention something. Beginning to my next week, and we'll be gone from vacation the week after that, but beginning next week, I want us to do justice to several verses uh, in the chapter next week, Romans chapter 3. And then in the sermon, I want to be more specific to a main point. So we actually may leave a few verses at the beginning of the chapter and study the chapter, saving the main verses maybe at the beginning for the sermon. I want to save the main, uh, what I would call the primary lesson for the sermon but secondary lessons for the class. We've done that to some extent already, but certainly next week. Circumcision has value if you observe the law, but if you break the law, you have become as though you had not been circumcised. Circumcision was an act on the part of God to make covenant with Abraham and his descendants. And it was a outward, covenant with his people. And those who were circumcised were part of that Jewish heritage, that family, and only the males, of course. But then he acknowledges that there are those not circumcised. So circumcision has value if you observe the law, but if you break the law, it's as if you've never been circumcised. In other words, if you break the law, you're out of covenant with God. You're out of covenant. If those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? 
To hear the word circumcised means under covenant. For those who are not under covenant, if they keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were under covenant? And we saw the Gentiles who did not have the law, their conscience became their law. So they, their response to their conscience became their law. And the one who is not under covenant yet obeys the law will condemn you who even though you have the written code and the covenant, you're a lawbreaker. So there may be people out there who live better than us that condemn us by their life even though we are under covenant. It's not suggesting anything goes and believe what you want to. He's just trying to differentiate the fact that we have a special covenant with God and it should mean something. And those who maybe don't have the whole truth, those who haven't understood all the things that are out there, it's changing their life. They're making life changes as a result of what they do know. In verse 28, a man is not a Jew if he is one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew if he is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit not by the written code. Such a man's praise is not from men, but from God. God judges who we are from the inside, not what we look like, not from external ritual. One writer suggested this is a story of the reality versus the ritual. Um, We were watching something on television recently and someone had created great crime. They had not yet been caught. And they walked into a religious building, ornate in its structure, took a candle, lit it, put it at the front of the auditorium and walked out. And everything I know about that outer ritual would suggest that they've done something important that makes their life okay. An outer ritual, lighting a candle. By the way, they had to buy the candle. They made the point, who's gonna pay for that? It's not outward ritual that God looks at but he does see it. It's the heart. He wants to see the inward person. Um, I've been told this for many years by renowned speakers that in most of our assemblies, there are people among us who, who look around us and see that we're dressed up. We look like everything's okay in our life and they assume they're the only one with a mess that's part of their life. And it's difficult for them to feel accepted in that audience or to appreciate their relationship to God because everybody looks okay and I'm not. And those speakers will usually at the end of the lesson make this point, just in case you don't realize that we are not okay. We're not okay. We all have difficulties. We all go through conflict. We all go through important times in each week where we are forced to stand up for what we believe. Or we're forced to be stronger than maybe we think we're capable. We're not okay. It would say to all of us in there, saved by the grace of God, there go I. 
And so whatever life has been for you this week, and whatever else you think about the rest of those who will gather here now and later for worship, we have struggles too. We are humble by our struggles, and we're thankful for a strong, faithful God. And by the way, that's our lesson next Sunday morning in the sermon, the faithfulness of God. Um, we're not okay. And it's okay to admit that, right? Anybody want to argue the point? We're not okay. Because as a, as a lawbreaker, we are sinners. Even if it's one law. We're lawbreakers. And um, these verses are trying to encourage the Jews to see that. They're certainly encouraging us today to see that. So many blessings some have. And to that blessing, there's an accountability or responsibility. It's very much a part of the other side of that coin. Do you remember in Malachi, they were accused there of robbing God? How does a person rob God? Uh, we talk about dishonoring God or someone robbing temples. How do we rob God today as Christians? Disobedient. Say it again. You're disobedient. Disobedient. When you don't give him the glory. When you're not giving him the glory, and those are things that find in the verses. When you don't give him your time. Don't give him your time. And your money. And your money, thank you. Come late, stay, leave early. <laughs> I think R.L. hit on it. Uh, Malachi talked about people who would suggest how great they tithe, a tenth, a tenth of their possessions, a tenth of their money, and a tenth of what's in the field. So it's really closer to 30% when you see the three areas of a person's life in the Old Testament. But when we don't give as we should, we're robbing God of something that is rightfully His. And we use the concept of tithe because it's used under the old law. They would tithe faithfully the righteous Pharisees, should I say the self-righteous Pharisee, would tie their mint and common and deal, but would neglect the greater blessings, if you will, that God gave them. And they were encouraged to do both. You tithe the lesser, but also the greater. And when we don't give as we should, we're robbing God of what is rightfully His. And uh, we, need to, we need to see what we give. We need to see it in view of what we have, what we've been given. Uh, I, I don't suggest how much. Uh, it disturbs me a little bit when we sometimes say that we aren't given an amount that we're supposed to give. To say that better, we're not given an exact amount but we're told to give as we prospered. So we are given some guidelines to those who've been given much, much is expected compared to those who've been given little as far as your income and your blessings. Uh, so we rob God when we don't give as we should. I think my dad, it seemed like I learned most from my dad. He, he left this earth way too early. But I remember him speaking on giving on an occasion, and he pulled out his wallet, and he looked into his wallet, and he pulled out a dollar bill and a five dollar bill, and he held it up. And he said, if you're like some people who haven't decided beforehand how much or what you're going to give, which of these is Satan going to choose? And he held up the one dollar bill again, all by itself. He says, I encourage you to give the five, and again, it's metaphorical, give the greater, and if you do it for two or three weeks, Satan's going to leave you alone. And he kind of laughed. But there's truth to that. 
give the way you should, and Satan's going to get out of the picture, because especially if it's going to be a temptation that would encourage you to give more, he doesn't want that to occur. So give as you prosper is the directive from God. And to me, if you if you make five hundred dollars a week, it ought to be closer to fifty than five. Is the most I would say. It ought to be closer to fifty than five in terms of what you give. Um, I hear noise back there. It's not early. Looking at the clock. Here. I, I have a note here. Uh, don't point the way, but lead the way. Yeah. Yeah. Don't point the way, but lead the way. Terry said. Um, observations before I read a paragraph, and we'll be through. I finish a little early. Substituting the symbol for the reality represents like writing a check on a bank account with no money in it. <coughs> the problem really isn't the ease with which we can write the check, but the existence of whether there's a bank account to back it up. We make vows at our baptism. We make vows at a marriage. We sometimes will have membership files that are part of being a part of a group, but they're only as real as the intentions behind them and the actions that are carried out as a result. Professing one lifestyle but living another, making a promise but not fulfilling it, claiming a symbol but violating its meaning, when we treat God with this kind of dishonor, we deserve His judgment. People are watching. People are watching. Thank you. <laughs>